Welcome back everybody to your delayed update on what will soon be the Molazan Empire. Um, by which I mean it's time to talk Dead House Landing. I'm sorry it took so long. I wanted to record this. Well, I actually tried recording it on Monday and then things, you know, happened. So I couldn't get it done. And then other stuff happened yesterday. I actually recorded a video yesterday and I'll probably put it up. It's about vinyl test pressings that arrived yesterday, um, so it's, it's kind of label focused. I might just put it up to see if this is something that you're all interested in. We'll see. But here we are, Dead Earth Landings. Um, I'm also super excited about another project that I'm going to start real soon. It's going to be really cool if it works the way that I think it should work, or it, it works in my mind. And it's going to be... Um, about religion, maybe, or fantasy, or both, or something like it. Um, let me know in the comments if you're interested in in something biblical, so to speak. Um, but anyway, without further ado, also um, let me know how the quality of this video is because I got a new camera. This is me talking into an actual microphone that might kind of narrow down the wind noise that I had before and I hope the quality in all overall is better because this was expensive. Well that's it for now. Um, if you you know have anything to say put it down in the comments. Like, subscribe, share with your friends. I would love to um, get more feedback and stuff. Anyway let's get started about Dead House Landing. Well cheers. So, Dead House Landing is a second book in Path to Ascendancy by Ian Cameron Esselmont. And um, I think I'm going to finish this in another four videos. So maybe I'll record the last one on Friday, put it up on Saturday, something like that. We'll see. Um, now that I'm super delayed with it, that's sort of the idea. Anyway, um, today we're going to talk about the first five chapters, I think. Yeah, one, two, three, four, and uh, five, I guess, and, and the, pre the prelude, obviously. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about, um, so this will have spoilers for it. I will reference stuff from other Malazan books, both Steven Erickson and um, Ian Esselmont, if I remember to do so. And we'll see how that goes, but I'll try to keep it as vague as possible and just say, you know, there's a connection to something in this or that book. Uh, shit like that. Um, I just feel that, you know, at least for me, as someone who has read everything at this point, the joy, the, the real joy in uh, reading Path to Ascendancy is to see those backstories and see how those legendary figures from the Malazan Book of the Fallen or on the other side, the... Uh, novels of the Malazan Empire, how they show up here, how they, how they start out, and something we've seen in the last book, obviously, with Dancer and Vu, uh, who will become Dancer and uh, Canon Vad and whatnot, and also with someone like Silk, and um, Smokey, and um, even Shimmer, who will be part of the Crimson Guard, and, you know, it's all over the place, and it's great to see how those people start out because if there's one thing we've learned from reading Malazan in general, right, it is um, that uh, Malazan is very much about the consequences, the long-term consequences as well as the short-term consequences of actions and um, that is kind of, you know, um, started off by the whole idea of that Azathani, who some people think is Karul, that uh, Gathas is talking to in the Azath house at the very beginning of um, the uh, of uh, Dante's Lament. Um, it might also be even thought to be started by Karul, doing what Karul did in Forge of Darkness, or before Forge of Darkness even, so um, that's kind of the idea, to look at how these things influence each other, and that means that I need to make 
references to other Malazan books. I'll try to keep it as spoiler-free as possible. Also, I don't think to mention that that Danza will show up in the Malazan Book of the Fallen is much of a spoiler at this point. Anyway, um, let's kind of get started with what we have. <clears throat> and the first thing to note when we're reading um, the uh, Dead House Landing is that the focus has shifted and also broadened at the same time. So we are, when we dance lament, we spent all our time uh, in Li Hang. And at that one siege of Li Hang, we are now spread out a bit more. The focus itself is on Malaz Island, which is cool. And um, people hanging out there, but there's other places of action. There is Kartul, where we meet everyone's favorite high mage, Tay Shren. There is Li Hang still, where um, uh, Dasim is still hanging out, kinda, sometimes. What, and so forth, right? Um, there is obviously, you know, mention at least of what happens on Napan. Nap? Napan? I think Nap is the word, you know, in the Napan Islands and whatnot. Because that influences obviously what happens with um, um, uh, Surly. Um, so, you know, the, the focus, the overall focus has broadened out. We see now several places and how events in those places all lead towards Malaz Island, or will they? I mean, right now in the first part, we don't know if if or how Teishren ends up on Malaz Island, or how Dasim gets there. We just know that, you know, at the end of <laughs> the, once the Malazan Empire is founded, all of those people show up on the island, so we see how all those different, like, uh, plot lines or characters or what have you, these are connected to Malaz, that crazy city in the middle, you know, on that island. That's dirty, and everyone's pa favorite pirate haunt, except it's not Caribbe Caribbean and no one is drinking rum all the time. No, they're drinking weak and sour ale because it's raining all the time. Malaz sucks big time, I guess. But it does follow <clears throat> or represent some of the cliches that we have when we look at cities <clears throat> in role-playing games. That being, this is basically a crime city. You have a lot of street gangs and whatnot. Something we saw kind of in Li Hang, but even more so because this time around, even the ruler of the city is basically a crime lord. Everyone's favorite um, um, holder of Mock's hold, well, the eponymous Mock, who took over that castle, and he's basically a pirate captain, but he has a wonderful new battle mage, and uh, that is Tattersail, one of my favorite characters from Garden of the Moon, if maybe not my favorite character from Garden of the Moon, he, um, she's already battle mage of Mock's here, so we also need to figure out how she uh, you know, comes from being Mox Battle Mage to, <clears throat> you know, becoming a Carter Mage, basically, in uh, Garden of the Moon. Gonna be interesting. She's very young, though, and, like, you know, that's the other part here. We see how all those characters that we see in the fullness of their power in later books, how they start out as dumb fucking teenagers, most of them, or something like that. And I guess we <laughs> can already say that, like, we already know that with Dancer and Vu, but even with, probably also with Dasim, and definitely with Tattersail, and up to a certain point with um, Surly, uh, or Lady Serath, as she's called. Those are not very smart people at this point. They make teenager mistakes. They're angry, they're... Um, either ruled by, like, their own arrogance and self, um, you know, sense of self-importance or, um, well, arrogance or their glands, which do all the thinking when you're 16, um, or a lot of your thinking when you're 16. So, 
So that's kind of what goes on there. So we have the broad picture. Now let's... Alright. Fucking shut up, you fucking pipe. Stupid. Alright. Um... Thanks. Alright. So, let's continue. Um... So let's look at like spe uh, specific things that happen in this, like these first chapters. What do we learn? Um, we learn that after a lot of failures, probably due to <laughs> Vu's um, uh, innate Vuness, which is his great vulnerability, um, Dancer and his mage buddy have ended up in Malaz Island, and Vu has bought Smiley's the bar which has been kind of low-key taken over by a group of Napans, which are not very welcome in Malaz Island, which are hiding out because, as we learned in the prelude, they are refugees. They're refugees from uh, a battle about for the Napan throne. And the loser and rightful heir to the Napan throne. This is will this will be really important later on when we talk about why Surly is the way she is. Um, well, she lost, but she was the rightful heir to the throne, and she and her loyalists, those being certain crust brothers, and um, a certain knock will later on become an admiral, and others have. Um, fled with her and are hiding out. Urkor, the poor bastard, is not allowed to build dinosaur skeletons. Nope, he has to be the cook. Which, you know, probably is not too much fun. While Cartharon is out being a cap, well, not a cap, but he takes over a ship later on. Um, the point is, um, they are forced to work together at some point because Wu and Dancer start off a gang war because obviously they want to take over the city again because someone never fucking learns and how do they do that by piss off pissing off crime bosses which is a well-established tactics that we have seen before and once that happens they are kind of you know forced to sort of let surly and her gang into what's going on and that's how things start out in smileys at the same time, we meet um, Teishren, and this will be the next big thing that we're going to talk about. And one of my favorite things, Teishren is someone who um, kind of comes across as a massive dickhead in Gardens of the Moon. Um, which I think is kind of unfair, but understandable. The point is that Teishren, as we see him here, is very much the... Um, child, I don't want to call it child prodigy, but he's something of a prodigy, he's a hugely talented mage, but he's not very good with, like, people, he doesn't have any people skills at all, and this is a problem, because he's part of a temple hierarchy, he's part of a temp the temple of Derek, everyone's favorite worm goddess, which, you know, cool. And we're going to talk about that part, because I, one of the things that I kind of found a weakness, or sort of something that I wish we could have seen more in the Malazan Book of the Fallen, or in the Carcanus trilogy, is the whole idea of religion. And we get some ideas about like what the worship of Direct does versus the worship of Hood, and this is something that I'm personally very interested in. <clears throat> the idea is that the worship of Direct is about the cycle of life and death. So, fucking idiot. Yeah, the cycle of nature. People die, turn into earth. Earth is where new things grow, and those new things die again. You, you know the drill. <clears throat> Which is close to what um, at least romantic anthropologists of the 19th century 
felt was like pre-Christian religious belief in pagan belief in Europe. <clears throat> you can go and read your James Fraser, which I highly encourage. It's a fun book to read, The Golden Bough, and a lot of other stuff, which is all about that cycle of nature and the worship and the cycle of the cycle of nature. And that is then compared to the interloper hood, and I like that anal anal analogy. Oh, God, it's my English analogy. Um, <laughs> I like that analogy. Because what the belief of Hood does is that it is a linear, not a circular belief when it comes to the, how life works, right? It's you live, you die, you enter Hood's realm, that's it. And that is very similar to what we see in Western religious beliefs, whether you're Christian, Jewish, or Muslim, right? The Abrahamic religions are all about <clears throat> you live, you die, you end up in paradise, or you burn in hell. But it's, there's no coming back. <clears throat> so the idea that there might have been a circular way of um, how life and death works. And then with what Hood does in the Carcanus trilogy, he kind of forced that linearity onto lives. It is something that I find very interesting, or <clears throat> at least how they, what he did forced the idea of linearity onto people that are like, wrestling with the questions of life and death and how that works. It's something that I find personally fascinating or interesting. <clears throat> we'll see if that gets developed further or if that's just, you know, thrown out there and that's it. We'll see. Anyway, there's obviously hierarchies, and hierarchies are always all about intrigue, about true believers getting pushed aside by the bureaucrats, which are power-hungry motherfuckers. And after this um, wonderful jump cut, necessary because my camera overheated, we're back to talk more about this religion, right? Um, I'm obviously burning the sun for you here, it's terrible. <laughs> anyway, we're going to look at um, something that both um, the religion of Derek and the religion of Hood have in common. And the problems thereof, right? The problems that follow, like the problem that we have with death is that we need to accept death, right? Death is a fact of life. We all kind of die at some point, and most death is random for each and all of us, right? It, it's unfair, it's unjust all of the time. Now, the difference that we have is that with the circular nature of life and death that we have in the belief of Derek, or in what, what you might call, you know, your pagan religions, if they existed and if they were the way that we think they were and so forth, is that even a random death gains meaning because it leads to new life about, you know, what we see before. <clears throat> but once we have a linear version of religion and a linear version of life and death, that death doesn't have any meaning because all that happens is life is over and your soul ends up in Hood's grab bag of souls um, or Hood's realm where nothing happens. Now in modern times, in our world, we have kind of solved that by coming up with all kinds of ideas of afterlife that give our lives and deaths meaning because, you know, we get rewards or punishments or what have you, but that doesn't exist there. So what we learn from that is that, and what we see, we see that directly in this book, is that once there's a plague that randomly kills a bunch of people in and around Li Hang, people are asking Dasem to intercede with Hood, which he can't do because Hood is not the arbiter. He's just the guy who takes the souls. And um, that leads to all kinds of problems and rage against the cult of Hood. On the other hand, we see what happens on the island of Kartul, where um, criminals are just thrown into like holes and eaten by insects, and no one has no one has a problem with that um, because those deaths are meaningful. And even the sick person that is in the street that. Um, our good friend Tay Shren walks past um, and then that will die. That plague death there is also not seen as random or unjust because it leads to new life in the future. So what we learn there is that you can run a death cult 
that gets away with a lot of stuff, including um, the, the death penalty. <laughs> um, but if your deaths are meaningful, and that meaning can come just through that circular idea of life and death. On the other hand, even though you may never do anything wrong or bad or whatever, you may still get into a lot of shit if your death cult doesn't provide any meaning for deaths, which is the problem with Hood. Now, we all know that Hood is obviously someone who is not really interested in meaning. <laughs> it's kind of a Jack Hood thing. They don't believe in that kind of stuff that much. Um, but it kind of leads to the questions like, how can that be a successful religion under humans? Now, obviously, we'll learn more about that in the um, later Malazan books, and I think it's Dust of Dreams, where we have a long conversation about it, what it feels, and obviously we also have, and this is something that I find interesting here, um, that I need to get <coughs> explain, have explained by someone. So my idea was that priests, or whatever you... Um, forge a connection with their god and get religious, get magical power from them. <clears throat> get whatever their warren is, right? So you are a necromancer, you're like a priest of Hood, you get like access to Hood's warren and or whatever you have there and do like necromancy magic. Like our buddy Dead Smell in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. Now, on the other hand, and this is crazy, our buddy Teishran is deemed a priest, but he doesn't have access to Drex Warren, which would probably be Driss, not Triss, but, uh, but, you know, that Earth Warren, I guess, or something like that. No, he has access to the Fire Warren, among other things, because, you know, <clears throat> so I'm kind of confused how that works. So maybe there is both the idea of being a priest in just a, like, real-world, secular sense, not secular sense, but a, a non-magical sense, which means you worship a specific deity. And you can still be a mage at the same, at the same time. That's something that I'm kind of confused about now. So maybe someone can help me out with that. But I'm just saying it still doesn't feel like it makes a lot of sense to me how the religion stuff works out in Malazan. I mean, it's nice to have all this, um, how to say, um, critique of organized religion, and we'll see more about more of that in the next couple of chapters, I guess, when we have the idea of that outside, not really inquisitor, but maybe inquisitor or overseer, and there's something dark going on with him. And we'll see what that will be, but that's when we're going to talk more about politics within religion and how that works. Okay, another thing that we need to talk about, another person we need to talk about, is the Weaver, Agela. Now, some of you may remember Agela from some of the uh, Malazan, like, novels of the Malazan Empire. And she shows up here again. And the interesting thing is, she's a very, very powerful mage. Maybe even Ascendant, we don't know. Because we don't really know what Ascendancy is, at this point at least. But what she does is she weaves tapestries that may just show part of the future. And um, that is obviously something that we've heard about in different mythologies. The idea that the act of weaving can, um, weaving can actually um, foretell the future or um, not foretell the future, but actually create the future is something we have, obviously, with the Norns in um, North, Norse mythology. We have it with something like the Fates in um, Greek, Greco-Roman mythology. The idea that it's connected to weaving or spinning is something that we've, he's, like, you know, sh seems to lie very deep in human, um, like, in the human psyche, I guess. I'm not quite sure why that is the case, but I mean, I guess the image is powerful. You have all these individual threads that could be individual lives, and once you weave them together and step away from it and look at the whole tapestry, you see the whole, like, the whole, and that kind of feeds with our human wish to have meaning in our lives or be part of a larger 
meaning <clears throat> in some way. So I assume that is um, maybe something that lies behind that. I just find it interesting, and so Agela is part of that as well. <laughs> so um, what else do we see? We see um, we have um, Tattersail trying to be more than just a mage, trying to have like some power, and this is something that we'll see throughout the entire series and um, which will be interesting when we look more about Te uh, at Teishren later on but people like Tattersail look for power worldly power as well as magical power right Wu and Dancer look for power um, Surly looks for power all of these people that will form the core of the Empire not all of them I guess Dasem is another one that doesn't really look for power but a lot of those people are driven by power and you know, forge this alliance in the future. For now, she's just a battle mage, and they're all sent out on that um, uh, <coughs> raid to take that convoy of uh, transports, which turns out to be a trap, and almost everyone dies. Um, but Cartharon sails home one of the ships. He meets someone named Dujek, a marine, so that's cool. Another one of those names that sounds familiar. And um, what we learned there is, when they return, is the politics. And this is something that we haven't seen so much of in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. And the reason for that is obviously what the Empire does, which is something that also, for example, the, the Roman Empire did, is right? We have here on Malaz Island, we had it in a similar way before in Don's Lament, when we had the war between Itko Khan and Li Hang. We have all these um, enmities between different, like all these feuds, these um, may even, you know, that is probably, there's a like an element of racism in there as well, because you distinguish some of those people by the skin color and everything, but they have all that hatred between all these smaller groups and so forth, which gets, you know, makes it possible for someone like Wu or later other people to insert their, the crowbar of their will and destroy these individual um, groups to take over and form them into a larger whole, as um, Wu certainly does later on, I guess. <clears throat> so that's another thing that we see here when we have um, the enmity in the bar and also when Mok comes down and doesn't want to give Carthron like any kind of promotion because he's a Nepan and he just puts in one of his cronies and it's like the loyalty of Dujek and some of the others that actually gets Carthron some recognition <coughs> which also obviously uh, binds Dujek to um, the rest of the people and I feel that's probably another thing here that we learn here is <coughs> the loyalty that Dujek one arm shows in Mal the Malazan Book of the Fallen towards the Empress and not the Emperor could be linked to the fact that the first person he befriends is Carthron, another Napan, and one in someone in service of Surly, not Dancer and Wu, right? So just a thought that that may also have played a role in why Dujak just kept on keeping on instead of like leaving. I don't know. We'll see. Another thing that we learn is obviously there is the dead house, which is in the house of the Azath. So we first get like our first, like for this series, first encounter with like Azath houses that take stuff. <coughs> In this ta case, taking stuff means one runt of a mage. We also have another excursion into Shadow. We learn that like getting into Shadow gets easier. We learn there's denizens in Shadow that used to be there. There's theories about like parts of Shadow that is, that are shattered, are drifting one over the other. Things like that. We learn about the fact that there are portals to Shadow, doors to Shadow that are sealed. And obviously that's something that we've heard about before in Dance's Lament, right? When a certain Azath and I talk about it, but now we actually see a manifestation of that, that gate that is sealed from inside, not from outside. So I guess 
<coughs> someone trying to figure out how to blow open those gates will be part of what happens in the near future, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's kind of more or less what happened in those first five chapters. I mean, Dasem's in some shit with the um, Protectress because he can't, um, obviously he can't placate Hood because Hood doesn't do anything about that. It's not Hood's job, but it doesn't make him popular. So um, there might be reasons for Hood to, uh, for for Dasem to leave um, Li Hang in the near future. And um, yeah, there's a lot of like, ideas for future threats and um, there's two more chapters in part one because this book is part you know separated in two parts part one and a much longer part two um so we'll see how that works i guess tomorrow i'll just talk about the end of part one and mm, mm, probably already like the openings of part two because i don't know how other how else to structure this um we'll see anyway um, I guess this that's it for tonight. Um, I'll uh, be back tomorrow with more stuff. And um, uh, until then, have a great Wednesday. Cheers. <laughs>